During the time of the pandemic, you visit McDonald's more often than you should. French fries, sometimes a filet of fish. You park your car on Court Street and enjoy your meal of styrofoam, salt, and fish product. You compose emails to ex-boyfriends and ex-friends that you dictate into your phone using voice memo late at night. Dear high school ex-boyfriend, who is now a child psychiatrist, you were my first bad boyfriend. Dear ex-friend, I don't know why we stopped talking. Was it me? During the time of the pandemic, you will start to meditate. You will sign up for a course in miracles. You will start a food diary. During the time of the pandemic, you binge watch terrible television shows. You binge watch The Real Housewives of New York, Beverly Hills, and Orange County. You begin writing a novel. You look at real estate you can afford, but most of it is unappealing. You look at the homes. Kate Hudson's home has a particular fascination for you. You Google old classmates. You search for Owen Bateman, who made fun of your brother on the late bus. You look for Frank Manolfi, the boy with the feathered hair and the tight Levi's corduroys that you had a crush on in the sixth grade. You think about telling off your You think about telling off your mother, but you never do. You watch her watching Fox News, taking notes, a scowl on her face, the same scowl on your face, her face reflected in your younger face. Filled with horror and disgust. Think about yourself in your twenties. You look at pictures of yourself in your twenties. Your skin was beautiful. Your skin is perfect. Your hair is shiny. Smooth. Your smile is the smile of innocence, of contentment. You look happy. You blame the Chinese. You blame the government. You blame the Russians. You blame the casting director who told you you were strange. You clean out your closet. You clean out your basement. You clean out your spice cabinet. Baking spices. International spices. Exotic spices. And salts. During the time of the pandemic, you think the world is ending. You watch Contagion. You watch Kate Winslet die. You watch Gwyneth Paltrow die. You watch her lying on her kitchen floor, foaming at the mouth, undeserving of Matt Damon's love. You wonder as you watch her die, did she create goop before or after she died? I hate making ice. I'm not sure if it's the spillage that occurs whenever I fill an ice tray, or if it's dipping my hands into an abyss of my cold, overstuffed, undersized, hard to navigate freezer. I mean, I just tried to refill the ice tray and it's like my freezer pulled a Maxine Waters reclaiming my time moment. In the time it takes me to remove the empty ice tray to refill it, I guess my husband hates making ice as well. The open space quickly becomes a failed game of Jenga consisting of frozen peas, chicken thighs, and chopped meat. The global pandemic has only exacerbated the need to make ice. In the time of COVID, ice has become the frosty lifeblood of the quarantine cocktail, essential to both day and evening libations. The steady flow of cocktails necessitates an endless cycling of ice, forcing me to be a frozen Sisyphus who is ever filling ice trays. As a person of a certain size, I always seem to leave the sink with a saturated belly when I make ice. I suppose I need an ergonomic sink to accommodate my protruding, well-fed gut. Are cutaway sinks a thing? I may need to file for a patent. In public restrooms, my sham wow stomach proves especially problematic. All too often, osmosis and my dry belly sop up stagnant pools of stranger sink water. 
The transference of this public petri dish is nearly instantaneous and always a surprise and especially gross. Upon noticing the sudden uptake of water, I start spiraling into 80 commercial catchphrases to make light of the awkward situation. Madge, I soaked in it, or the quicker picker-upper come to mind. It seems the gods have cursed me by setting my groin to the standard contractor grade counter height. When conditions are right and the counter skews ever so slightly towards me, the results are disastrous. The sopping shame of my groin always comes with an ensuing panic Everyone is going to think I urinated all over myself. If I'm lucky, a hand dryer can remedy the situation, but it comes at a cost. My dignity is quickly sacrificed in the pursuit of dryness as I perform crotch thrusting yoga for the bathroom entrance. If a hand dryer is unavailable, I pull my shirt down as low as I can and lift the waist of my pants so high that I leave the restroom resembling an awkward Humpty Dumpty. Hey, but nobody thinks I peed myself. When the length of my shirt is too short to mask my shame, I do the only thing I can do, embrace the suck. I turn on the sink, cup the water in my hands, and pour the water all over my pants, akin to what Jackson Pollock did to his canvases. I know I've achieved my goal, when my wet crotch is indistinguishable from the surrounding saturated fabric. My goal is to have people ask, uh, what happened to you? Once I hear this, I know I've achieved my success, even if I am a little soggy. I guess that's what resonates with me. Every time I fill up an ice tray, that moment of awkwardness, that moment of, is this really happening? That moment of, I don't want to be here, and please make it stop. Spoiler alert, it never does. Ice melts, and someone always has to fill the tray. Dear Steve, Renee, Mike, and Troy, I want to thank you for your consideration. I have taken a few days to process all that transpired this month and my unexpected termination. I was very surprised by the decision to let me go. I am one of only two protected class employees on the revenue team, and we were the only ones laid off that I'm aware of. I can't compare myself to everyone else on the revenue team because I do not have the stats on membership and renewals, but I do know that my performance in bringing in the much needed new revenue for the foundation has been high. Mention that the reasoning that led to your decision is that this is an unprecedented time and revenue will not be the same. However, I had reached 75% of my sponsorship goal with the full three quarters remaining in the year to bring in the additional revenue. Even with some drop in sponsorship dollars due to COVID-19, I was well within my ability to bring in what is needed for the event budget. Virtual events carry significantly less expense than live ones. Virtual events carry significantly less expense than live ones. Virtual events carry significantly less expense than live ones. in my 
heart in the midst of a pandemic. As a cancer survivor, I have a calm morbidity to the coronavirus. I live alone and cannot even leave my house because of the health risk. As you can imagine, this decision to lay me off at this extraordinarily difficult time has been extraordinarily devastating. Despite all this, the Foundation made the decision to offer reduced salary choices to all of its other employees, but thought it was in their best interest to let me go. In regards to the foundation, I will bring up several examples where I grew sponsorship significantly in the span of a year. Two of our most valued members moved from $25,000 in sponsorship to $75,000, and from $22,000 to $75,000 respectively, a 200% growth rate for both of these companies. I did this through multiple conversations and consistent interactions over a year. I did not do this alone, of course, but I was instrumental in making it happen. That is to say, I was confident that business with us grew so drastically because I created the packages, orchestrated the conversations, and put the necessary compelling packages in place. In the first year, at the foundation, I had reached 50% of my goal and was on target to meet or exceed my goal of $1 million in 2020. In fact, before COVID-19 hit, I was at $750,000, 75% of budget in contracts, not including Google. After the virus hit, yes, some of those contracts were in the process of renegotiating, but not by much. The South by Southwest event partnership held its virtually still managed to reach 100% of its budget. We had $45,000 in additional revenue just one month after we launched the new inventory. It is largely because I emailed members mid-launch from my hospital bed, after which I spent significantly time after hours to create the new presentation and proposal collateral. I did not wait. I did all of this to protect the foundation's bottom line, and I did some of this from my hospital bed in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs>
ask that you kindly consider increasing my severance to more accurately reflect my value and service in the current pandemic environment. It's strange how these losses don't always affect me, or they don't affect me the same. The way people expect me to be more upset just because I shared someone's last name. But then suddenly, somebody with whom I shared not a droplet of family blood is lost. And then there is this feeling that fills me, the uneasy rise of a flood. There's so much about me that only you knew, all those secrets I locked in your hands. We had so much more that we wanted to do. Now that's canceled before we made plans. I hope that you know that they kept me away that they wouldn't allow me to come. Then they told me, so quick, in one breath you were sick, by the next you'd already succumb. At first I just listened, tried not to be angry to find out that way, way too late. And mom's voice was cracking, she loved you so much, so I figured my feelings can wait. They came, not right away, like a leak from a pipe. I was lucky my pockets were stuffed with those coffee shop napkins. We used to grab extras, so many, but still not enough. It won't always be like this, yes. Yes, I know that. But there's only so much to do because... Though you're gone, I can't seem to stop feeling that I just can't wait to see you. So, here now, I find myself perched on the edge of a precipice, some call belief. And, other than Xanax, it might be the only thing offering me some relief. Can I believe there's a heaven? It may be the one thing I haven't tried yet? Or is that just my way of setting the date for tomorrow's that we'll never get? That we'll, that we'll never, never get? get. Those motherfuckers. Those motherfuckers who bought all the toilet paper, who, who never cleaned a day in their lives yet hoarded all the Clorox wipes, who bought all the oat milk and the almond milk leaving the chocolate milk beverage for the rest of us suckers. Those motherfuckers who hoarded all the flour, yeast, and sugar, stocking the larder like a long winter was coming, you know, like Little House on the Prairie style buying all the organic goods, the gluten-free pasta, the steel-cut oats. Oh, look what I made, they post in their stories, baking their lives away. And, and yes, yes, I posted a story about my stupid bacon fat biscuits, and yes, I filtered the photo, and I added an effect so the biscuits looked like they were surrounded by magical rays of fucking light. So maybe, maybe I'm a motherfucker too. Those motherfuckers who refuse to wear a mask, who to refuse to acknowledge social distancing. They think they're the only people living in the world and their genetic makeup has predisposed them to instant immunity. Those motherfuckers who jog recklessly up and down the streets, maskless, flaunting their athleticism while sending their oral plume far and wide for all of us to see. Those 
motherfuckers working for the New York Times, writing articles about what to cook during quarantine, how to stock your pantry during quarantine, what to do instead of shaking hands during quarantine, articles about what you should be wearing, thinking, and doing during quarantine, how to make art during quarantine. Readers have questions about sex and the coronavirus, and we answer them. Exercising outdoors with a face mask, how crying in your car counts as self-care, and you don't need all-purpose flour for this pound cake. Those motherfuckers who fled the city to their country homes with their entitled, whiny, attention deficit disorder riddled, screechy, ill-mannered, badly behaved children who have sidewalk tantrums and hit their own parents, zooming from their front porches, manicured gardens and exposed wood beams, parents complaining about the hardships of homeschooling, when I as a teacher spend more time with your kids than you do on a daily basis and your kid can't be bothered to change out of their pajamas or get out of bed for our Zoom class calls, but yet you had to have those kids with your intro, vitro, extra, extra artificial insemination so you could have a family even though you couldn't afford it, so a nanny could raise your kids while you both work, and now that you don't have government subsidized babysitting services, you're starting to realize that your kids are thankless brats who have no ability to take or follow directions, have little to no interest in learning, no imagination, no drive, no passion, no ability to self-motivate or self-regulate because the Jamaican nanny did everything for them. But we, we had to look up words in a dictionary and put away the dishes and do chores for an allowance and shut the hell up when our parents spoke to us and understood the boundary between student and teacher and went to the library to look in more than one book to find answers to questions that we hand wrote on paper with pens. We who wore hand-me-downs and called our friends on rotary phones and wrote letters to our families from college and passed notes in high school and met on the corner to walk to the candy store and, and picked up our bicycles from their parking spots on the hot asphalt of the driveway in August for afternoon rides up and down the hills of suburbia. We who listened to entire albums and held our tape recorders up to the radio to record our favorite songs who tuned in weekly to watch our favorite TV shows, waiting a whole week to see the next episode, who didn't know what a mocha frappuccino was or a meme or a gif or a hashtag or an MP3 or a WhatsApp or a Facebook, FaceTime, Pinterest, Etsy, Google Duo, Seamless, PayPal, Venmo, GoPro, YOLO, FOMO. Those motherfuckers on Instagram posting courses that we need to take because we have so much time because apparently this pandemic is a vacation, a reprieve, a retreat, a rest, a chance to get some shit done. I don't want a master class with Helen Mirren or Neil deGrasse Tyson or fucking Anna Winter. I don't want to start watching the hundred best films or finally read On the Road or The French Lieutenant's Woman. Stop telling me how to get more followers by learning how to use the three seconds I have to grab someone's attention. And I don't need to take Mind Valley's eight transformations or a one hour session with a British hypnotherapist who says, people have no time to spend in therapy and reading books. We think the mind is complicated, but it's not. You can transform in minutes. I can turn anyone into a super achiever in 2020. And please, you do not have to tell me how productive you are that you just demolished your Fire Island bathroom and are moving on to the fireplace, which will have custom lime green tile inspired by the flora and fauna of Cherry Fucking Grove as you share your daily walks down the weathered boardwalk to the deserted beaches of the South Shore. Those motherfuckers sharing their mantras and their kirtans and their TikTok dances and their thoughts of the day and the three things they're grateful for and their your quotes about tragedy and photos of themselves in the woods and of their kids and of cute dogs and a glass of beer and short films documenting their drive in the Pacific Northwest and the posts, the posts that all begin with, hi guys, hey guys, okay guys. So here's the thing guys, <laughs> repost this, tag this, link in bio, check out my website, I'll be live tomorrow morning. I just want to punch everybody in the face. It, it's just, it's too much to take in. It all feels like a very effective and diabolical distraction from the reality that we're all going to fucking die. 
someday at some point. So, okay. Maybe it's okay at this time to do nothing. Like, is this really the time to take life by the balls and in the words of Auntie Mame, live, live, live? Why aren't we live, live, living? What are we doing? Why do we need cleanses and retreats and social media purges and self-help books and, and chakra alignments and coming back to yourself, a retreat for creative women? Or are you psychic? Tap into your power and find your soul purpose. We all have this nagging voice telling us, live fully, live up to your potential. You need to be amazing, not average. Amazing is so 2005, but everyone now is amazing. Why do we have to be so amazing? Can't we just be normal human people? Even during a pandemic when your, your time could literally run out, we're being told to make the most of our time. Let's lower the bar. Work out or don't. Have a sandwich. Sit outside, plant a flower even, but don't post it. Don't write about it, don't talk about it, don't hashtag it. Take a nap, talk to someone on the phone, let time stretch. Do you remember when time stretched? Tell those motherfuckers to settle down. Tell those motherfuckers to leave you alone and take a deep breath, not a cleansing breath or a three-part yoga breath or a breath that sends energy into the heart chakra so you can forgive your father. Just, just a normal human breath. Breathing for oxygen's sake. Just one breath and then another and then another. I bought another plant today. I tried to sneak it past my husband by tucking it behind some pothos and a monstera. I figured the canopy of plant foliage was enough to hide the new addition from my suspecting spouse. It didn't work. He found it almost instantly, which is pretty impressive for someone who can't distinguish a peperomia from a sansevieria. You bought a new plant today? No. I had that already. No, that's new. Caught. Just like that, red-handed. Or would it be green-thumbed? In any event, he was right. I bought a new plant and clearly failed at botanical espionage. Why does that even matter? Why is the addition of a new plant cause for concern? I am what you would call a houseplant hobby enthusiast or a houseplant hobbyist. At least that's how social media defines me and people like me. Essentially, I'm a plant hoarder, limited only by the amount of light streaming through my windows and the humidity in the air. Sorry, succulents. The problem with being a plant hoarder is no one really cares if you are one. People look at the collection of plants you've amassed and praise it. Other plant people entice you to get more by flaunting their latest and rare Instagrammable ethereums and philodendrons. It's well known among us plant people types that the only individuals who take issue with your plant obsession is your partner or spouse. With space at a premium, they all too often find themselves in an ever-shrinking footprint of habitable space. To alleviate the natural stressors of my space-invading hobby, I've become pretty adept at stacking and balancing plants neatly against windows and walls, mostly. Occasionally, my plants will have other plants in rebel. Holding me hostage, some plants will refuse to stay green and drop their leaves until, at their behest, I move them to their preferred location. Okay, maybe I'm being slightly dramatic, but 
Sometimes you just have to shift your plants around until you can find a spot where they'll thrive. Recently, I discovered that some of my plants like to roost on my coffee table. One plant revived almost instantly, cementing its location. I'm still waiting for the backlash I'm going to get when my husband feels a machete is needed to get an unobstructed view of our television. Perhaps I should queue up Jumanji? Don't get me wrong, I love the lush jungle look. If I had my druthers, I would have walls of plants flanking me on every side. I want to feel like I'm wrapped up in a chlorophyll cocoon. COVID-19, however, has made my dream unattainable. No, you can't catch COVID through houseplants, but you can't find them either. Nearly eight months of quarantine has caused Gen Xers, Millennials, and Gen Zers to converge on my lifelong hobby and buy up all the available plants, both foreign and domestic. I guess this pandemic necessitates bringing the outside in, providing a sanctuary during social isolation. While I am respectful of their plight and newly found hobby, the obsession and fervor for which they approach the plant market is relentless, driving up the cost of plants and emptying all available inventory. It's the worst. How can I compete with the overly tech-savvy, carpal tunnel-free, 20 to 30-something, who seemingly have limitless budgets and tenacious index fingers ready to left-click on anything being sold that is remotely green? What's a hoarder to do when there aren't any plants to hoard? The only thing he can do. He dips the stem cuttings he has in brooding hormone, and he propagates. I was telling a friend that the real curse of cancer, if you make it through the first time, is the question or the fear that it will come back again. Cancer is a stalker who hides behind every test, every yearly physical, every medical hiccup, Every form you fill out for the rest of your natural life. What does natural life mean anyway? Natural as opposed to unnatural life. And since my diagnosis 10 years ago, I can think of several times where I felt terror as a result of one test or another. It's not a normal fear. It's more gut-wrenching than that. It's like your insides are being eaten. You're alive. You're watching. You can feel everything as they eat through your stomach and they get out into your entrails. It's that kind of gut wrenching, folks. Like the Walking Dead. Uh huh. Remember that moment when Glenn was under the car? Yeah? That moment when he was under the car? It's like that. And there you are, with your guts hanging out, staring at the sky, searching for the internal answer to the bigger why. Why, God? Why? The plaintive why, God, why yelled up at the unforeseen towards the unknown. Even if you don't believe in a God, you may find yourself begging like this, bargaining with the universe. The gods, the ghosts of your ancestors, the guides, an entity, whomever will listen to you as you beg fervently for a positive outcome from some god, any god will do, really. This is the real haunting. The fear creeping about as it does, shifting the edges of your natural life. This fear that feels like your guts are suddenly being skewered and food for zombies. The first time it happened, they found those moon-like slivers, again, in a mammogram. <laughs> I remember. I just went into this 
uncontrollable crying fit. A, a crying jag, really? It, it's just, they asked me to come back in so I could take more scans and an ultrasound until it culminated into a biopsy right there on the table on Friday at 5 p.m. And I was crying my head off. And my sister, Laura Kim, she was holding my hand. And I just couldn't stop crying. And I was wondering what she was thinking at this extreme display. And it was extreme, you know, like a super snot riddled, red faced, visceral crying accompanied by the kind of breathing where you just can't catch your breath. It was unplanned and immediate, like a baby screaming for her mother. I wailed for my survival in that small room, lying on the flat, hard table with my heart exposed and my chest laid cold and bare. The technician doing the ultrasound was appropriately concerned, kind and distant, a recognizable symptom of cancer hospital care. Everyone is so nice, and yet I feel that separation that disease, the disease creates, the distance of my condition, which is tiptoed around with these small smiles and the subtle nods of the head, a secret understanding that my situation sucks. The technician said I was lucky as the doctor was still there at 5 p.m. and on a Friday and they could perform a needle biopsy. Hmm. Lucky, huh? But then this question of lucky, it is something you hold on to as you measure yourself against others. I'm lucky. I have the old lady cancer. I'm lucky I don't have those BRCA genes. I'm lucky I had the mammogram at 38, or they would never have caught it. But really, who is lucky with a cancer that comes back to haunt you every scan, every test for the rest of your life? <laughs> there you are again with the lucky. I'm lucky at least I have a life. Comparing the suffering gets tricky when you've had cancer. When I would see my oncologist, I would think, well, those old ladies, they're old. They don't have that many years left to be haunted like this. And really, these are terrible thoughts when they happen. But then I'll have a friend who will be on sta in stage four when I was only on stage two. And I didn't have the chemo, even though I almost had the chemo. But then I had to have three surgeries, and maybe they only had two or one. <laughs> it's the suffering game show, folks. Who has had it worse? Or at what point or period of my life was I suffering more than I am now? This one sometimes stumps me. For example, in my teenage years, I do recall feeling miserable, but almost as if the misery were entirely of my own making and I just didn't penetrate as deeply because I didn't know myself as well. But now, well, now I have the resources to sink and sink deeply into a vast well of sadness. Growth equals expansion, equals deeper feelings, equals more despair. But then, shouldn't the equal and opposite be true? More expansion should also mean more joy. And then also the more despair I have, the more compassion, right? The latest cancer haunting happened just two weeks ago when I went to the ER with a swollen right calf. Now there was something I convinced myself was nothing. I am forever the escapist. I am convincing myself and others that everything is nothing and at some point I'll turn in on myself in such denial like the white blood cells that we've been hearing about that just go into overdrive and kill the thing that they're trying to heal. I'll manage to be burn myself up in denials and be swept away by my own words. Well, maybe I injured it when walking to the gym or on my lunch hour or at the gym working out with my trainer. I didn't realize it till now. Yeah, that must be it. I was sure the swelling would go down eventually. It just put my foot up. Mayhaps uh, the swelling will disappear overnight while sleeping. I mean, what could it be? What could it be? A simple leg pull. But the swelling didn't go away. It stayed with me all weekend. Me and my heavy waterlogged leg 
relentlessly dragging around my log of a leg, Gimpy and me, me and Gimpy. So eventually I relented and I looked it up online. And after researching, it was unfortunate news. As the internet always brings, quite possibly, I had this thing called deep vein thrombosis that can be particularly deadly if it breaks off and goes into your lung. I like to say it like this. Deep vein thrombosis. To be continued. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Laudable's Virtual Reading Room for Kids. I'm here with my good friend Vic in the recording booth at Laudable Studios so that all you boys and girls at home can open up your ears and listen to a new story called The Bullfrog and the Flies. Yay! Does anybody know what sound a frog makes? Very good. <laughs> Question, uh, Vic, uh, you're going to edit in the frog sounds later, yeah? Because otherwise I think it might sound so confused. Silly. <laughs> Does anybody know what sound a frog makes? Very good. Here we go. Once upon a happy pond with frogs and flies well fed, everyone shared happily and most of them weren't dead. But in their midst, a grumpy bullfrog on his lily pad plotted how he'd get more food than all the others had. So the bullfrog warned of crickets at the edges of the pond and put their kids in cages so they'd all stay far beyond. Uh, Question, Vic. This is political, right? Because, you know, I'm a children's performer, so I don't do that sort of thing. No? Okay, okay, okay. And since so many creatures did not doubt his croaky claim, the bullfrog was their leader on the day the sickness came. But once the sickness caused too many of the flies to cough, and bleed, the bullfrog feared they'd get too sick to bring the food he'd need. The bullfrog croaked like magic that the sickness would go away, and if the flies would just be brave, they'd die much less each day. <laughs> Question, Vic, uh, uh, are we sure that the bullfrog isn't supposed to represent anyone in particular? Any, uh, I don't know, unfairly criticized world leaders? No? Okay. <sighs> That's when the grumpy bullfrog unveiled his big surprise that he would lead his frog friends in the eating of the flies. And if a fly would dare ask why, the bullfrog said one thing as he snapped off their tiny legs and chewed each little wing. He said that flies should know frogs don't make promises to keep them. You say what creatures want to hear. If they disagree, you eat them. Vic, is this irresponsible? Should we be encouraging dissent among our young listeners at such a delicate political time? Well, yes, I, I, I suppose I see your point, but someday they'll be old enough to vote. All right, all right, all right, I'll, I'll read the rest. For now, the bullfrog lies upon his lily pad in size. For he enjoys the quiet with less buzzing in the skies. The bullfrog isn't troubled by the wherefores and the whys, just wonders whom he might eat next when he runs out of flies.
We hope you've enjoyed this laudable presentation. Hear you next time. Well, that's it, Vic. I guess at least we got a happy ending. <laughs> I'm gonna go grab a banana. Because in 15, I start recording the new JK Rowling. Yeah. Oh, I hear it's really inoffensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs>
Eventually, I went to grad school for acting and Jennifer dove headfirst into the world of women's rituals and sacred circles. Jeunesse is now a doula and a certified priestess rising. There are rose petals and altars and candles, something about Mary Magdalene and you are the chalice and taking back the narrative of the heretic. There are crystals and a photo of hot chocolate, except she calls it cacao, Gaia's secret elixir, and it can heal the heart of humanity. She posts photos of her beautiful life on Instagram in Northern California, hikes and cups of coffee in her golden retriever. Under a photo of her husband, she posts a caption, nobody loves me like you do. Jennifer has 4,000 followers, Brittany, 5,000, Kate Hudson, 12 million. I have 87. Hmm. I wonder if I'm living my truth, if, if I am the chalice, if I need to be the chalice, or should I be seeking the goddess within? I wonder if I'm even interesting enough to have an Instagram account. It's now midnight. I'm on episode five of the new CW series, Roswell, and Liz and her alien high school sweetheart are in a big fight. Her research on alien DNA is dangerous. I quickly IMBD the cast and get lost down a new rabbit hole of where did they grow up and what did their parents do? Were they nurtured and held like Kate Hudson's baby? I'm still seeking the formula for success, still comparing that feeling of not being enough, of wishing and doubting. Yet I have more than enough, I suppose. But when is enough enough? Cutting my hair is nothing new to me. I have been doing it long before it became a pandemic trend. Over the years, I have mastered the mirror imaged over the shoulder neckline trim with both buzzers and scissors. My adeptness at self-grooming was originally spurred on by my frustration over hairdressers always wanting to quaff and tease my thick head of hair to heights that resembled the loftiest pompadour of a 1950s male. Barbers were never an option for me. I went where my mother went. My earliest memories of getting a haircut was by a neighbor in a makeshift studio, in a semi-converted garage. There was always the sound of a screeching bird in the background and the overwhelming scent of chemicals that used to perm women's hair. Did I mention I grew up in the 70s and 80s? Somehow, my mom decided that these backroom studio permanents were no longer cutting it. And she had moved on to the big time, a salon an actual salon. Riding her apron strings, I came along. The first time I stepped into a salon, I was surprised that it smelled more like shampoo than the noxious fumes I had grown used to. I was taken how vast the space seemed. The large mirrors anchored each station created a hall of mirrors effect that when viewed from the right angle, would reflect indefinitely. I remember feeling shocked to learn that there was even a separate room where you would wash your hair. For the first time, I was able to enter a space without the fear of toppling the precariously stacked hair care products that loomed over me in my neighbor's house. It was exciting for me. I'm not sure why. Perhaps it was the shiny new thing that my seven-year-old self was experiencing. People knew each other and talked across the salon. Gossiping and exchanging quips about this and that. The men in the salon had a different nature than the men I knew outside the walls. Softer, warmer, a muted masculinity that was comforting and unintimidating. I was first introduced to Gina by my mom. Attractive and well put together, Gina had a habit of chewing gum in the side of her mouth and snapping it in the corner. 
Before I knew it, I would find myself in a chair that would spin and raise when Gina would step on a pedal. Higher and higher I would go until I would reach the, hair, the chair's maximum height. Despite the towering heights that I would arrive at, I would still need the dreaded booster seat. This was always a production. I believe that the salon only had one booster seat in its entirety. Gina would shout across the salon, who has the booster seat? I would try to pretend it was not for me. But as the only seven-year-old in the salon, it was evident who needed the boost. I was always happy when the men would bring it over to Gina. Here you go, hon. A wink and a smile always made me happy. Together, my mom and Gina would discuss how my hair was going to be cut, and then Gina would execute their vision. Years would pass, and I would eventually grow out of the booster seat and into the chair. Gina began cutting my hair without my mom by my side. Initially, I would ask Gina for a certain cut, but she would always confirm if it was okay with my mom, stopping at times to even call her for confirmation. By the time I achieved hair autonomy, I had already become self-aware and self-effacing. Gina was a creature of habit. When she would finish cutting my hair, Gina would hold the mirror at varying angles around my head so I could see the precision of her cut and style. I always hated this part. As if it weren't difficult for this overweight, brace-faced kid to stare at himself directly in the oversized mirror for 40 minutes. Now, Gina expected me to behold her work. Whenever this would happen, Gina's face would become emotionless, she, like she was dropping into actor's neutral. This was one of the rare moments Gina actually stopped snapping her gum. I suspect that she was setting up her before the Academy Awards face. You know, like when the ensuing accolades are announced and the actor reveals the sudden flash of surprise and excitement with temperament of tempered humility. Unfortunately for Gina, I would never gush over my haircut. I would remain deadpan and emotionless. If pushed, I would mumble, it's fine. Or if I thought she was really in need of a confidence boost, I would say, <laughs> it's great. I really love it. I should mention that my haircuts always look the same, with the exception of that one time when I decided to have it spiked. Not a good look. Honestly, I didn't care what I looked like from the back or from the sides. I couldn't leave quick enough. I just wanted to get home and wash the hairspray and gel out of my hair. As uncomfortable as I had become in the chair, in my later years with Gina, I knew it spoke more about my insecurities than Gina's abilities. But at that time, my burgeoning self decided to take matters into his own hands and with a scissor, started to cut. I first started trimming the side of my hair around my ears. And with growing confidence, I would go up my sides and then to the crown of my head. The appearance of my earliest haircuts looked kind of like a goat with an underbite chewing hay. The, who needs crimping when you have an experience? Gradually, through trials and many, many errors, I became more adept at my cutting skills. There was a time when I wanted to actually be a hairdresser. During my orientation of my community college, every student was given a career aptitude test to help students focus on their academic goals. Still in the closet, I was nervous to tell anybody about my results. A florist, a flight attendant, and a hairdresser were the top results the test gave me. I'm surprised Fluffer wasn't listed in one of the results. I wasn't mad at any of my possible choices, just their implications. Incidentally, the major I settled on was liberal arts with a general studies emphasis. I mean, 
why don't they just rename the major really undecided with I have no fucking clue emphasis. Hairdressing was a career that would have allowed me to live anywhere and openly as a gay man. I figured I might even do better as a gay man with clientele if I added an affect to my voice or a swish to my step. Unfortunately, I never pursued my ambitions, but I would continue to experiment on my hair and friends' hair intermittently throughout the years. Although a career in hairdressing never manifested in the time of COVID, my skills have proven useful. No, they won't feed me or assure me of having enough toilet paper or hand sanitizer, but they will keep me presentable while day drinking during a Zoom meeting. I actually didn't realize how dangerous the deep vein thrombosis can be until I started watching. Dr. G, medical examiner. I usually watch true crime documentaries, but Dr. G just seemed like a good choice. Upon watching the first three episodes, a couple of her cadavers had dropped dead mysteriously. It turns out they dropped dead because of deep vein thrombosis. The clots just broke off in the high and, thigh and just ended up right in the lung. It's called pulmonary embolism. Apparently it's a big deal. You can really drop dead, just like that. Drop dead from pulmonary embolism caused by deep vein thrombosis. But in a typical fashion, as someone who convinces themselves that most things involving my health are not much of anything, I ignored it. And uh, just like I ignored the chest pains I had a week before. Yeah. My chest started hurting after this impromptu lunch hour massage. I was walking back to work and I was very out of breath. I thought, well, this feels strange. Almost like my lungs were stretched tight inside my chest. It reminded me of a feeling I had as a kid, you know, like when you used to run full on out there in the cold and the school field and you're trying to play soccer. I started wondering if maybe I was having a slight heart attack. But then I was like, isn't my arm supposed to tingle? I mentioned it to my coworkers, and they expressed a healthy amount of concern. I guess it was a healthy amount of concern that I was unable to express for myself. I just continued to ignore it. I was like, well, let's just see if it gets worse. Sometimes I think it could get better or worse. I don't know. Pretty much I'm an idiot. Folks, never ignore chest pain, shortness of breath, or a swollen leg. Never. So a week later, the leg swells. I wait the weekend, and then I finally go to the doctor who orders an ultrasound, and voila, I'm ordered to go to the ER. The radiologist tells me my leg is very blocked. It's almost the whole upper thigh. I tell him, sure, I'll go to the ER, but first, I need to go feed my cats, and then I got to pick up my charger. He doesn't think this is a good idea. I have a big clot that runs up my upper thigh, and I don't care because other than the swelling, I feel fine. I mean, maybe I'm just get those blood thinners, you know, instead, and I argue with him for a bit at this point, and he just says, look, the standard procedure is to go to the ER. I'm really reticent to go to the ER right now, folks. Really reticent because we are in the middle of the coronavirus in New York City. Let me repeat that. Coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. Clearly, this is the worst time to go anywhere near a hospital, much less the ER. Obviously, the hospital is the best place to catch the virus. It's March 11th, too. It's right before the real shit hits the fan. <laughs> I've been reading all the articles on the virus. I've been carrying around those Lysol wipes, wearing a neck warmer around my mouth and nose for the past week, trying not to breathe in too much as I ride the crowded subways from Brooklyn to Manhattan and back. I don't touch anything. I don't touch anything in the office, nothing. I have an antibacterial wipe. 
I wipe my bag down. I wipe my coat down. It's funny that in the midst of the pandemic, these health management tactics come up. And then I just don't consider the dangers of my almost heart attack and the swollen leg in the same way. At home, I managed to read my reach my primary care doctor who agrees I need to go to the ER. And so after feeding the cats, packing the chargers, my wife, some granola bars, a phone and a computer, I'm on my way, Ubering to the ER. The ER is in Cobble Hill. It's an affluent area of Brooklyn. It's also associated with my alma mater, NYU. I feel like it's a good choice. This is my first time in the ER. It looks full. Maybe 25 or 30 people are in there. The intake staff is behind a glass office area. I'm already feeling sorry for them. I assume the worst is about to happen when they get slammed with all those corona coming their way. I'm thanking them effusively as I hand them my papers from the radiologist, and I guess the deep vein thrombosis is indeed a very serious condition because they move me right up to the front of the waiting list. Then I turn around and I assess the room. Who here has the COVID? There's a guy in the corner next to the trash can. He looks miserable. He's just coughing and blowing his nose. And he's, he's wiping his spittle. He's sitting half falling off the seat. He's not looking well at all. I peg him for the corona. There's a Hasidic couple. The wife is complaining of stomach pains. At the time, I didn't think she had the corona, but in hindsight, now it's possible she did. There's this young lady dressed in a purple hippie velveteen coat with fur trim who is wearing flowered pants. She looks like she doesn't belong here. Is this, is this like an ER look? When she sits down on the floor in front of the glass office and then slumps a bit as if she's in pain, oh, she begins to look like she belongs here. I steer clear of the corona. I make my way several seats away from him and the others, and I proceed to wipe everything down with my Clorox wipes before sitting. There can be no room for error here. This is prime corona catching here in the ER. My friend, Tina, visits me. That's very kind of her. I was really not expecting it. We're at the cusp of Corona just before the descending chaos. And Tina, who had a friend with DVT, she's highly sympathetic to my cause. Apparently, this is a very dangerous condition. I really appreciate that someone would consider my condition seriously because, once again, I'm thinking about how lucky I am and I shouldn't complain because I have health insurance and they caught it. I don't seem to have Corona. A young Hasidic man sits next to us with his friends. It looks like he hurt his arm. I find it curious that there are several Hasidim here. It's not really a Hasidic neighborhood that I know of. I have to look it up on a map. I wait for what seems like an interminable time before they call my name. I'm let in. I'm led into the ER, off to the side. Looks like a kiosk of sorts. There's a central command station and the place is full and chaotic. All kinds of computers are being wheeled around and people are typing furiously, people in curtained off areas and stretchers lining the wall. I sit there, I try to take it all in. Is this what I expected? I open my bag, I take out a granola bar. The young hippie type girl is in the next kiosk over. I offer her a granola bar, she refuses. She's telling me she feels like she has DVT. I'm like, oh, really? I have DVT. This is so exciting. We both have DVT. Why am I so sardonic and sarcastic all the time when disaster is befalling me? This isn't funny. I just can't help myself. I have to do this. It's my main coping mechanism. I have to make fun of myself, disparage or belittle my situation with my weird humor. Do I really think this is funny? Do I want people to take me less seriously? Is that why I do it? Like I'm not worth their taking me seriously. 
like I'm not worth taking myself seriously. What would happen if I just stopped joking around? Who would I be? Serious me young? Straight face somber me young? Non-emotional me young? Cold me young? Did I lose my mind? Fall apart? Collapse in a heap? Dissolve into a puddle? I mean, who doesn't want to just dissolve into a gooey puddle if they could just sometimes, you know, less stress. I could become a humorless blob just seeping into the cracks, crevices of life with no knowledge of my predicaments and the challenges it takes to live in this godforsaken body. Get rid of the container, folks. Speaking of containers, I could do what the Tibetans do. I could have a sky burial, gently laid out on the mountain to hop. The proper rituals performed by a master, my discarded husk of a body left out in the elements to be devoured by vultures. It's very poetic. My body being slowly and purposely plucked away one piece at a time. There is also a Tibetan Buddhist practice called Chud, where one imagines one's body being eaten away by hungry ghosts. The suffering masses of humans stuck in that realm because of greed or miserliness with their bloated bellies and their necks seeking and failing at fulfillment. I used to do this chewed practice in the New York City subway on my way to work each morning. For a year, I enjoyed the fact that no one in the subway, no one was privy to my secret imaginings of my body being eaten away by these dangling neck, bloated, belly hungry ghosts. There's a coffee shop in my neighborhood. It's called Hungry Ghost. I often wonder about its name and the karma that could potentially result. I mean, hungry ghosts in Buddhism, it's not a good thing unless, of course, they are thinking they're helping or assisting the hungry ghost by feeding them. When I order coffee from Hungry Ghost Coffee Shop, am I one of the desperate hungry ghosts? This is what I think about whenever I go there. Aren't all of us in your city hungry ghosts? Scavengers craving and consuming and taking over and destroying? and yet still hungry and wanting more and more and more. button for a nurse could write on your wall and when symptoms are severe i fear and disappear that's all that's all i would order you a monoclonal cocktail but i'm not exactly sure who we could call and some steroids for the fight that may keep you up at night. That's all, that's all. You did not wear a mask when you should have. You attended some so 
social events where you shook every hand that you could have did the opposite of what prevents infection I appreciate you keeping social distance I know that quarantine not a ball, but it's like the Spanish flu, someday we'll forget it too, that's all, that's all. I know that quarantine's not a ball, but it's like a Spanish flu. Someday we'll all get it too. That's all. That's all.